We live in an age of progress. The world today is better than it was a year ago, and a year from now, it'll be better still. Everyone is becoming richer, happier, and freer. Or at least that's the story we like to tell ourselves. But what if it's not? What if the world is becoming worse? That question is at the center of dystopian literature. And no two works of dystopian literature are more representative of their genre nor as influential as George Orwell's 1984 or Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. 1984 is about life under the most oppressive regime imaginable, one that takes the worst aspects of the worst ideologies of the 20th century and mixes them into a society of maximum evil. Brave New World, on the other hand, depicts a far more likely society, one that our world is becoming more alike every day. The society of Brave New World is controlled and pacified by sedative drugs. Its guiding philosophy is scientific materialism. No one who lives in it owns anything, and human happiness and comfort are its ultimate goal. We have before us a dystopia of tyranny and a dystopia of comfort. Let's find out how they compare. You can call me Ezekiel. This is 1984 versus Brave New World. Let's jump in! Oceania, the state and subject of 1984, is held up by two pillars, force and lies. The lies are used to control its people, and force is used to handle anyone that the lies don't work on. To carry out this system of repression, the state expends vast resources on propaganda, surveillance, police, and military forces. This system is highly effective, but also extremely expensive. The protagonist of 1984, Winston, is intelligent enough to track and compare many of the lies the state is telling him, and accurately concludes that the society he lives in is declining. There's less material wealth every day, and the party spends those dwindling resources on hiding the problem and taking out anyone who notices it. If ever given the choice between willing compliance and tortuous submission, the regime of 1984 will always choose the latter, even if the former is cheaper and more effective. The expenses of all of this lying, spying, and enforcement are causing everything to collapse. And in the end, it does collapse. That's the opposite of Brave New World. The society of Brave New World is a centrally planned, technocratic superstate. I don't mean that its economy is centrally planned, I mean that the very existence of every single human being is centrally planned, all the way down to their embryos. The society is split into castes, but the members of these castes are not naturally born into them, but grown in labs, where they're selectively bred and conditioned for their roles. Lower castes are made to be less intelligent, and to find menial work more agreeable. Higher castes are smarter, and frequently more creative. That may sound awful, but life in this society isn't particularly terrible for anyone. If anything, the society is extremely prosperous. It's scientifically designed to be so. All of the members live rather content lives. And why shouldn't they? Every member is engineered and conditioned to be suited to their life. They're also conditioned since birth to love one another. This goes as far as training everyone since a young age to view sex as nothing more than a handshake. Medical science plays a key role here, because, with a society practicing such free sex, it's important to prevent unwanted pregnancies. In fact, all pregnancies in this society are unwanted. Remember, humans are supposed to be grown in labs. Contraceptives are readily available, and all women are taught both to abhor motherhood and how to prevent it. In this society, unproductive sex is safe sex. Because there are no parents having children, the people of the Brave New World have practically no history, and dystopias removing themselves from history is a key theme in both books. Both the Brave New World and Oceania have destroyed their pasts, and have very little care for the future. All they have is an eternal present. In 1984, this is just another way to control and repress people, but in Brave New World, it's simply because they don't care. Life in the present is just too good to worry about the past, and the future is taken care of with the people farms. Both regimes are implied to have come about in the aftermath of some sort of crisis, but Brave New World's regime seems to have come about more slowly, and more naturally. Near the end of the first chapter, the narrator has a bit of a breakdown, and starts quoting random things he's heard from across the society. One of those incomplete snippets is this. In the end, said Mustafa Mond, the controllers realized that force was no good. The slower but infinitely surer methods of ectogenesis, neo-Pavlovian conditioning, and hypnopedia. And the quote cuts off there. But this perfectly explains the nature of Brave New World's dystopia, and how it's different from 1984's. 
It's not based on force. Force is too expensive. It's too inefficient. Instead, it's built on careful conditioning, on creating consent. The narrator then goes on to say that a lot of evidence of the past, like books and statues, have been destroyed, but also implies that sufficient records of the past have been kept. Unlike Oceania, it's not that this society fears its history, it just doesn't care about it. This isn't the only way in which our two dystopias are totally opposite. But why are they so different? The dystopia of 1984 is often described as having features of both communism and fascism. But that doesn't make any sense. Communism and fascism are fundamentally incompatible on multiple levels. Oceania clearly isn't egalitarian, and it doesn't try to be. Its society explicitly features a proletariat separate from the ruling class, and the ruling class makes no effort to rule on their behalf, so it's not communist. On the other hand, the regime claims to be a multinational empire, with no care for its subjects' racial or national origin. That means it's not fascist or national socialist either. The truth is that the ruling party of 1984 lacks an ideology entirely. What little ideology it does have is that of its own power. Orwell knew that that was not a sustainable framework. That's why the society of 1984 fails. But this lack of an ideological identity has a lot to do with why 1984 is so popular. What little ideology the regime has is that of sophistry. It doesn't care about right or wrong, it only cares about power. That's why the truth can be whatever the party says it is. This also means that the party can easily be interpreted as any ideology that the reader doesn't like. If you hate communism, then you can easily identify the party as communist. If you hate National Socialism, then you can easily identify the party as National Socialist. Or if you hate both, which most people reading the book will, then you can say that it's a mix of both. This explains why so many people think that the party is a mix of communism and National Socialism. At the same time, Winston, our protagonist, doesn't have much ideology either. The only real belief he has is that there's such a thing as truth, and that it's worth speaking. He is the Socrates to the party's sophists. But since that truth is not specified, and is being oppressed by the ideologically malleable regime, Winston is the perfect vessel for the reader to insert their own ideology into. 1984 is one giant victim fantasy, where the protagonist can be whatever belief you like, and the evil regime can represent whatever beliefs you hate. A regime without ideology, oppressing a truth without definition, is bland, inoffensive, and broadly appealing. That's why 1984 is so much better known, and so much more frequently referenced than Brave New World. There's even a stereotype that 1984 comparisons are overdone. And it's overdone because both the protagonists and the antagonists lack definition. They're so undefined that comparing something to 1984 is practically synonymous with calling it bad. Actually, allow me to rephrase. <clears throat> Saying that something is like 1984 is synonymous with calling it double plus ungood. Really, the only unique idea that comes out of 1984 is its theme of speech manipulation. In fact, Newspeak comparisons don't seem as tired as the more general 1984 comparisons, precisely because it's more specific. So how does Brave New World compare? It's not an original observation to say that Brave New World is better than 1984. Aldous Huxley said so himself in a letter to George Orwell, and I'm inclined to agree with him. In part because it's just the better work of literature, but also because it's the better realized dystopia. There's something about the Brave New World that 1984's Oceania doesn't have. When you read about the Brave New World, when you imagine what your life might be like inside of it, for a brief moment, you want to live in it. The Brave New World is comfortable, it's scientific, it's easy, it's seductive. There's a scene near the end where the protagonists incite a riot, trying to convince the drones of the system, who are really quite well treated, to fight for their freedom. When this happens, the system's enforcers rush in to quell the chaos. This is when you'd expect the heavy hand of the state, the cruelty of the system, to reveal itself. But that's not what happens. Instead, the police use extremely humane means to quell the riot. They use water guns filled with a sedative, along with a voice box scientifically perfected to calm anyone who listens to it. When the enforcers finally reach the protagonists, they don't even sedate them. The enforcers just ask them to surrender, and when the protagonists do surrender, they're treated remarkably well. The system is not cruel. It doesn't have to be. It may manufacture its participants' consent, but that is consent nonetheless. What happens next is even more telling. The protagonists are taken to meet the system's leaders, and the leaders are willing to answer any questions they have. 
When the protagonists ask them why they don't let everyone be intelligent, or why they don't reduce everyone's working hours, the system's leaders answer that it was actually tried. But in both cases, everyone became miserable. When they launched a colonization mission to Cyprus composed exclusively of alphas, they couldn't work together, and no one wanted to do manual labor. The colonists themselves were the ones who asked to end the experiment, but only after 19 out of 21,000 of them died in a civil war. When working hours were shortened for the drones, they didn't become happier. They became bored and restless. These decisions weren't made because the society was cruel or its leaders parasitic. They made a genuine and scientifically guided effort to make the society the best it could be. All of the protagonists are convinced by this, all except the savage, who grew up outside of the society. But the regime is so reasonable, what could he have possibly said to argue against it? Here's the best he could do. The savage asked, Isn't there something in living dangerously? There's a great deal in it, the controller replied. Men and women must have their adrenals stimulated from time to time. It's one of the conditions of perfect health. Regularly, once a month, we flood the whole system with adrenin. It's the complete physiological equivalent of fear and rage, all the tonic effects of murdering Desdemona and being murdered by Othello, without any of the inconveniences. But I like the inconveniences. We don't, said the controller. We prefer to do things comfortably. But I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. In fact, said Mustafa Mond, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. All right then, said the savage defiantly, I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. Not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent, the right to have syphilis and cancer, the right to have too little to eat, the right to be lousy, the right to live in constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow, the right to catch typhoid, the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. There was a long silence. I claim them all, said the savage at last. Mustafa Mond shrugged his shoulders. You're welcome, he said. Brave New World is both the better dystopia and the less popular because its regime is highly specific. It has an ideology, scientific materialism. And what's more, it's an ideology that's real, one that powerful people believe today. And because of those powerful people, it's one we could very easily find ourselves living in soon. And that's 1984 versus Brave New World. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. And if you'd like to help us make more videos like this one, support us through Patreon, Subscribestar, becoming a channel member, and PayPal, links to all of which can be found below. Up next, we're going to talk about the Spanish Civil War, and some of the men who experienced it firsthand. I'll see you then.